Okay. Uh, so the two products that we released this year that we're going to be talking about are the uh, water deficit trends tool and the spatial climate analysis tool. And uh, they were kind of uh, natural directions for us to go after we developed our GIS products a couple of years ago, and those kind of matured a little bit. Um, so we decided to kind of tie web applications to those products, and they've opened some different doors. Uh, another component has been the uh, support of grid ACES, uh, and because of that, we've been able to add some uh, grid capabilities to these applications. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen now. Uh, so first up, we're gonna talk about the uh, water deficit trends tool, which we released first. Um, to access this tool, just like most of our web applications, you just go up to services at the top of our homepage at hprcc.unl.edu. You go to services and then online data services. And when you're here, you get a listing of all of our web applications. If you scroll down in the maps and graphs section towards the bottom, it's in alphabetical order, we have uh, water deficit trends. And uh, we'll be removing this notice in the next couple months, hopefully. Um, so water deficit trends is an attempt to let you look at kind of midterm trends in our longer term SPI uh, uh, analyses. Um, and it'll do those trends up to six months in the past. Um, so right off the bat, we have uh, our map here on the right-hand side uh, where we're displaying all the information. And then on the left-hand side, we have kind of our layer control panel that controls what's going on on the right-hand side. So what we're looking at right now is the 30-day SPI and that's what's colored here. So for instance, in Lincoln, Nebraska, we got this orange color. So we know that the SPI is between negative 1.5 and negative two. And if we hover over the point, we can see exactly what the value is. But we also have this arrow that's giving us an indication of what the trend in the SPI has been. And we set that trend range using this slider here. So over the past week, at Lincoln Airport, the SPI has been trending down. If we take that back a couple more weeks, say to three weeks, well, we can see that we're, we've still been on a downward trend with the SPI. So if we zoom back out, we can kind of see that this uh, capability is supported for any station that we can calculate SPI for or SPEI. Uh, we'd like to add precipitation as an option to this in the future, but these are the two that we're supporting right now. You can change to SPEI using the product button here. And then we can change the time scale here as well. So if we want to look at the 90 day SPI, we can see that's uh, colored here on the color scale. And then we're comparing the 90 day SPI from today to the 90-day SPI three weeks ago on August 3rd. And I believe these are uh, tied to Wednesday's, uh, Wednesday SPI collections. So we're looking at weekly values compared to today's value. Uh, we have some additional layers available. So first one is the US drought monitor. So this is the latest drought monitor that's being overlaid. And we if you scroll down, you can see the key for that. And this kind of opens up some doors for, uh, you know, helping do some drought analyses using this tool. So if you wanted to look at areas of potential drought improvement or degradation, you can kind of uh, identify those areas a little bit using this tool if you're relying on SPI or SPEI. Um, you can also overlay RFC boundaries. Uh, some of these boundaries take a second to load. 
So you can see they're uh, labeled in green here. And we can also do CWA boundaries. And this one takes the longest to load. <laughs> but there they are. Another interesting feature of this tool is the ability to overlay the USGS gauges. And we do that by region. So right now we've loaded the Missouri region for the USGS and we have the flood states color coded. So if we take a look here for, here's an orange one and orange means is minor flooding. Well, we can click on any of these USGS gauges and it'll load from AHIPS the uh, flood state information. So you can see here, minor flooding, 16 feet. So this is a kind of neat little feature we added. Um, we're not sure what the application is per se yet, but uh, we had the ability to add it, so we did it. Um, uh, neat thing, I what I think is a neat thing is, uh, so you can see there's some gray spots here. And the gray spots are normally stations that we either don't have data for or that AHIPS doesn't have data for or they're, they don't monitor it for flood stages. Um, so for instance, uh, this station right here, when we click on this, instead of an AHIPS graph, we're gonna get a USGS graph from, uh, from water data. Now on the right hand side in the map, we have this little uh, kind of hamburger menu here. If we hover over it, we can actually change the background map a little bit. So we have quite a few layers from USGS here. Um, we can do kind of a basic topographic map. Um, this is this uh, national hydrologic data set. So you can look at the uh, uh, water basins a little closer and they have a plain shaded relief. And then we've also added this one from uh, Stamen Design. Uh, they have this kind of nice basic map if you're looking for more of a black and white background. We've also included some uh, additional layers from NASA, uh, mainly just for uh, curiosity's sake. So you can look at population density. Um, there's a link to the snow cover uh, data set. Uh, landslide hazards. Uh, these are supported by uh, NASA, so I'm not sure how well updated they are, but they are available for you to look at. Uh, up here at the top on the left hand side, we have an about this tool button that you can click and there's some information about the uh, tool itself. And then there's also this question mark here that if you click it, you'll get a little short tutorial that you can step through that kind of goes through what we're talking about today. But of course, this is only half of the tool. Um, so we can actually look at any of these stations and kind of uh, pull up a, a more, a better analysis of what we're looking at here. So. Uh, we can see here there's been a three week downward trend in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, so if we click on this, we'll pull up the trend analysis panel. And this is where you can actually uh, look at uh, this weekly uh, SPI information. So we have the SPI and SPEI plotted on here. This is the black and blue lines. You can see uh, sometimes uh, there's problems with calculating SPI because there's uh, certain data requirements in order to calculate that. So on certain stations, you might get a break that appears. Um, so that's why that can happen. That's also why sometimes you uh, can't get the full number of weeks that you'd like. So we can go back eight weeks here. Um, we can see the precipitations plotted on here and the normal precipitation. So we can see that Lincoln, Nebraska has been largely below normal when we're looking purely at precipitation values. We can also see the average temperature compared to the normal. And up at the top here, we also have this uh, weekly, uh, the dates, but under, underneath the dates, uh, there's this uh, weekly uh, drought 
monitor uh, level. So you can see that uh, Lincoln was not in drought until August 10th when it was at D0. And I think if we, we can confirm this by pulling it up and we're in yellow now and yellow is D0. And if we look at, uh, I guess, a more interesting area that might have a little more going on, um, so maybe here on the Arkansas River, we might see a little more variety. Uh, yeah, you see D3 became D4 later in the, in the year. So you can, uh, again, right here at the bottom, you can change the time scale that you're looking at. So uh, this is the uh, period of analysis for each data point. So in this case, you're looking at the 30-day SPI at, on July 6th, the 30-day precipitation on July 6th, et cetera. And we can change this to up to 90 days. So we can look at the 90-day precipitation. Oh. There must be one, one of the data sets must not be uh, complete for this. Um, I think another station. Syracuse. No, no, I think it's a bigger problem. But you can, uh, if the data is available, you can look at the, uh, at these different uh, time scales. It, requires that the uh, data exist for the time period you're looking at. Um, in some case, it'll let you get away with a break, but um, doesn't always. Uh, so the next tab available here is a table. So this is just a uh, table readout of the graph, and this can be downloaded as a CSV or printed. Uh, the graphs are also exportable here. And then our kind of an experimental feature is this report tab also. So this kind of gives you a, just a short narrative of, uh, of what was in the graph, um, along with a picture of the station's location and some information about the station. And then uh, if it can uh, if it can run it, which Sometimes it takes a minute and sometimes it fails. It'll try to get nearby USGS gauges and let you know what the stream flow is. And then it gives you that uh, weekly table on it. Uh, this is uh, kind of an experimental feature we added. Um, so common questions about using this. Uh, stations do pop in and out. Um, that's mostly because of the uh, data requirements to calculate the SPI. So if there's too many missing points for missing data points for a station, then uh, this, the station doesn't have SPI calculated for it. and It therefore doesn't pop up in the data set. Um, so that's uh, the reason, uh, the main reason why stuff can pop in and out on this tool. Um, this is new, of course, and if you find any problems, just let us know. We'll look into it, see if we can fix it. But uh, that is the Water Deficit Trends tool. So we'll move on to the Spatial Climate Analysis tool next. And we get to that the same way we got to Water Deficit Trends. You go to Services, then Online Data Services. And then if we scroll to Maps and Graphs and go to S for spatial climate analysis. We can click on this and get the tool. Now we can see right away that this looks very similar to the water deficit trends tool. And that's because uh, a lot of uh, similar groundwork went into the two tools. Uh, on the right side, we have the map display again, and on the left, the layer control. But on this application, we're looking at a web map version of the ACES maps, basically. Now, all of our GIS products are being plotted on the map on the right-hand side. So what we're looking at right now is the seven-day average maximum temperature, and the colors of the dots match up to what you would look at on our traditional uh, ACES maps. In fact, if we pull up the ACES maps, sorry, the zoom screen share thing is blocking me. Pull up the ACES maps here. 
and we compare it to the uh, and the thing is kind of annoying. Pull up the seven day average temperature. There's a dot map. And then compare that to the dot map for the seven day average temperature here. Um, we'll find an interesting data point. Uh, here's some red dots in Oklahoma. And if we look on the ACES map here, seven day temperature. So, oh, oh you, you know what? I realized now as I'm saying this, there probably is a difference. <laughs> Because the uh, old maps, the old maps use what's visible, and in this case, it's using what's uh, available in the entire data set. So it's uh, trying to draw these contours, uh, including places like Puerto Rico and Hawaii. Um, so that's probably why there's some differences. Uh, but anyway, anyway, the the coloring scheme is uh, um, similar to the ACES maps, uh, which you'll. Uh, when I pull up the contours, you'll see why I bring this up. Um, so you're going to see a consistency in the way that we draw the colors on the dot maps versus the contours. Um, so you can pick any product here. You can pick the time scale just like you can in the map images, but we can also change this to a contour map. And because this is a... Uh, a national product that you can zoom in on, we had to add more contours to this. And because of that, these contours will not match what you see in the map images. And that's in contrast to the dots where you're at least getting the same number of color levels and the contouring scheme is very similar. Uh, the dots are neat because you can hover over them to get values. So if we wanted to look up in North Dakota, Bismarck, we can hover over and see that the seven day average temperature was 74.1 degrees. And we can also click on any of these stations to learn more about them. So if we want to look at the Bismarck Municipal Airport, we can click on it. And it's going to open up our station data explorer pointed at Bismarck Municipal Airport. Uh, we can, and then we can uh, kind of dive into uh, more of the features of this. Uh, so if you want to look at the monthly precipitation 2020 for Bismarck, we can do that. And then our station data explorer lets you link to these graphs also. So if you all, if you wanted to have a, uh, to be able to pull this up all the time, you could bookmark this link here and you'd be able to pull up the 2020 uh, precipitation graph anytime. Uh, it's kind of a bigger deal if you're looking at something that actually updates, maybe the annual climate graph for this year. Um, so this, uh, so that links to the Station Data Explorer uh, older product, but it's kind of a nice feature to have. Um, so, that's the uh, colored station points. We can also turn on contours, which hides the station points, but you can look at the contours, or you can do contours with station points. And the station points are only going to appear at a certain zoom level. So if we zoom in a little bit more, we should start to see the station points appear. So we can see uh, text representations of the data pop up here. So for average temperature, we can see uh, it looks like North Dakota has been around 70 degrees in this region. But just like the water deficit tool, we have some other layers too. So we can overlay the drought monitor again, uh, which could be more interesting if we put something like the departure from normal percent of normal precipitation on here. And uh, maybe a longer time scale. <laughs> So we can uh, look at the percent of normal uh, precipitation on top of the drought monitor. So that's a neat little feature. And then uh, we again have our RFC and CWA boundaries. And we got some feedback from some uh, weather service WFOs uh, that they wanted some counties also. So we added the county layer feature to this tool. 
Uh, but it's only going to work at lower zooms. Otherwise, uh, you're waiting all day for it to load. So you can see as we zoom out, it's going to disappear from view. There we go. So now the county is no longer up here. Uh, just like before, as you load a layer like the drought monitor, you'll get the key appearing underneath the ACES maps overlay key. And then also, uh, over here on the right hand side, you can change the background map to any of those default layers that were in the uh, water deficit trends tool. Now, kind of the, the neat feature of this tool, I think, is the integration of grid ACES. And we can tap into that by clicking the grid point inspector right here. When you check this box, you enable the grid point inspector. So if we want to look at, say, this data sparse area here between Lincoln and uh, Topeka, Manhattan, Kansas, uh, we can do that with the grid, in, grid point inspector. So we enable the grid point inspector, and you'll see that we have a crosshair now on the map. If we click in this data sparse area, we're going to open the grid point inspector which is going to pull data from grid ACES and plot it here. Um, so we have a few variables available right now. You can uh, do an annual temperature analysis. We'll do that for 2020. And some of these take a little bit because uh, in the case of uh, quote normals or uh, where we're trying to calculate a normal, it has to pull this data from grid ACES. Um, but here we have a uh, annual temperature analysis for 2020 for this grid point that we just pulled. Uh, we can do that average temperature graph that we defaulted to. The max and min temperatures are line graphs just like the uh, average temperature graph. We can look at first and last freeze dates. So say we want to look at first and last freeze dates between 2010 and 2020. There we go. So you can see the first freeze was 8 April and 2 October. And we can uh, print a table or export a table of those values too. And every graph is exportable. Uh, we have precipitation accumulation also. Daily precipitation values. We can do monthly for a year or we can look at a range of years too. Uh, and then there's also some uh, cooling degree accumulation and heating degree uh, accumulations, which you might have seen in August. And dial it back to January. Yeah, sure, we'll do the full range. There we go. Looks like there's a little crowding. Uh, so this is the grid point inspector. And just like our, uh, all of our tools that we've been talking about, we have an about this tool button and a little tutorial button that can step you through what's going on. We can also uh, link to any of these grid point graphs. So if you bookmark this link, you'll always pull, pull up this heating degree day graph. And so uh, again, these are all new products. So let us know if there's any problems. Uh, you can uh, contact us by going to About Us and Contact Us. And if you fill out this form, you can, uh, you can contact a specific person and then contact me, or you can just say general website. In, in any case, uh, filling out this form uh, sends us an email and, and we can get back to you about any problems. Uh, with that, I guess we'll go ahead and uh, open up the floor for questions. Stop.